I'm going to report again. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're just letting people into the room, so, you know. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome. Be patient with us as we are admitting everybody. And if you see me looking at my phone, it's because there's people who are having trouble getting admitted to the space. So I'm answering text messages and admitting people to make sure that we can get at a good time.
During today's session, if any of you have any issues at any point in time, please private message myself or Dr. Blake. You can do that in the chat options. So please feel free to do that. If you don't have myself, that's the best, the next best step to get assistance. Welcome those of you just joining us. Please remain muted. If you all need any assistance point during the meeting, if you don't have my cell phone, you can just put in the chat in a private myself or Dr. Blakely. Please remain muted while you're on the call, please. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. As I said, please make sure you remain muted throughout the call unless you're being called on to share. If you have any technical issues, please just drop it in the chat. A private message to myself for Christopher Blakely would be fantastic. How's everyone doing today? How's everyone feeling? Coach Fly, that's a pretty sick background. I have to give credit to Awesome Kid, our video coordinator. If I had to do that myself, I would have to, it would be all stupid. <laughs> Pretty nice. That's my recruiting background. Hello, friends just joining us. Just a couple notes. Make sure you stay muted. We'll be starting shortly. Still waiting for a few friends to join us in the conversation today. If you have any problems throughout the meeting today, just drop oh, just drop a message in the chat privately to us. Checking my phone is because people are sending me text messages to assist. Your nesters? The say yes to the nest team? Is that what you <laughs> is that what you call them? You're muted. <laughs> welcome to the oh so, welcome to the nest. Not say yes to the nest is admissions. <laughs> Evo, um, yes. Welcome to the nest group. Yes. I'm saying say yes to the nest because I'm thinking like yep. that's when we used to have the say yes to the nest event. Appreciate you staying true to your roots, Isa. <laughs> <laughs> 
there are days that I do miss admission. <laughs> Amen. Welcome new friends that just joined. A few notes, please remain muted throughout the event unless we call on you to speak. We'll be getting started shortly. I appreciate everyone's support and being here today. It looks like we have a great group. <clears throat> so we were admitting just a few more individuals that are joining us today. We're waiting for a few more people and our presenters. I'll be doing a welcome and then I'll be turning it over to our student presenters and they'll be walking us through a presentation and some tips and some information from their own personal experiences and at the end we will share some action items for everyone to take away with them. There will be time for people to share stories to share their experiences um, if they so wish. Hello, I'm joining. I realized I was speaking and I was on mute. <laughs> a phone call, one of our students is having trouble signing in. One second, please. Once again, I just wanna say thank you everybody for being here. Um, looks like we have close to a hundred plus people here. So we really appreciate you all being here. As Issa Tease has mentioned, We'll have our student presenters uh, getting started in a few moments. We will be looking to record the session, make it available later on if those individuals may have schedule conflicts, may have to step away. Um, when we get started, ECTs will we'll kind of go over the community standards for today's event and kind of share how the flow will be. And then our student presenters will kind of provide um, some information to us and then we'll allow for some, some feedback as well as some shared experiences there. We will have some documents that we'll put in the chat as well as make available on our website for resources, um, but definitely want to let you all know that we do have our counseling and psychological services here. 
East will give specific instructions. But if you ever need to step away and go into a breakout room, we'll have that available for you as well. So we'll give specific instructions if you need that. Um, so that'll be made available as well as, you know, if you have any questions regarding technical issues or just programmatic things moving forward, you can reach out to East Tees or myself via the private chat as well as after this conversation. So we'll be getting started in just a moment. So just thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, we really appreciate your commitment and standing with us tonight and moving forward. Cause we know that, you know, we talk about allyship and advocacy. It is an action word, it is a verb. So thank you for being here tonight. All right, friends, we're going to get started in just a minute. Thank you, Dr. Blakely, for sharing that information. Those of you just signing in, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you all taking time out of your day and out of your week to be here with us. I think we're mostly here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Turn off my uh, Black Empowerment Station, um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. For those that don't know me, my name is Isati Spinero, and I serve as the Assistant Director for Multicultural Development Initiatives within the Multicultural Leadership Development Center, and I'm also the female advisor for the Dominican Outreach Program, aka also known as DROP. Um, they will be the ones that are going to be facilitating the discussion along with some things that we've helped to put together. And so um, just some different things to review for tonight, this evening, we are coming together to create a space of learning and listening. The MLD Center has asked DROP to, and their leadership team to just lead the discussion this evening. Um, but I want to discuss the community standards. So very first and foremost, um, everyone should keep their microphones off unless we call you to speak. Um, we will have people monitoring the chat. So if you do have something that you'd like to say, you can just drop it in the chat and we'll go ahead and call on you when we are able to. Um, we have the chat option available as well to ask any questions. So if you're not comfortable unmuting yourself and asking the question out loud, 
we can just look in the chat and ask that question on your behalf. And then we also have counselors on call for this evening. So if you at any moment feel like the conversation is overwhelming or you're overcome with emotion or for any other reason, you can message me privately in the chat and I'll go ahead and put you in a private breakout room with one of our on-call counselors and you'll have some time to discuss with them and then you'll be able to join the call again by leaving the room or you can just leave the call altogether by leaving meeting. So it's up to you and what you'd like to do after that moment if for whatever reason you do need it. We just wanted to make sure that we had it available um, if somebody did start feeling overwhelmed or just needed some feelings. Um, and then cert last but certainly not least, um, I'm going to read to you all a shout out policy that we've created for this evening just to make sure and ensure that we are keeping a respectful space um, open to um, some crucial conversations that are necessary. Um, just understand that you probably will be triggered by some things that are discussed this evening, whether that's from our students or from peers, um, but just know that we're here as a support system for everybody and we are here for each other. And this is a moment for us to learn and grow and move towards forward progress for ourselves and for our institution. Um, so in this program, the Multicultural Leadership Development Center strives to create a truly open forum. Hold on, we have people coming in again. One moment. Okay. There we go. All right, so um, where did I go? Uh, we wanted to create a truly open forum in which diverse opinions can be expressed and heard. It is the members of the university community and invited guests to express their views and opinions at the, in, at the university. We will protect the rights of individuals to speak and the rights of those members of the university community, community who wish to hear and communicate with an invited speaker or presenter. Protesters also have the right to express their opposition to a speaker in any appropriate ways, both within the confines of our buildings and or outside, which is right now virtually, um, as we're using this virtual um, room as our facility this evening. However, protesters must not interfere unduly with communication between the speakers and the members of the audience, so please be respectful of our student facilitators. If the hosts of the event, myself, Dr. Blakely, or the MLD team, or university representatives believe that protesters are interfering with speakers, freedom of expression, the protesters will be warned. So we will send you a private message if you are being out of line. And then if warnings are not heeded and the interference continues, we will make the individuals be removed from the virtual space that we're in. Okay, everyone good with that? Head nods, thumbs. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I would suggest that if you want to see the speaker, for those that are not familiar with Zoom, um, at the very top right corner, you have an option for speaker view, and then your screen will convert to the larger screen of that person that is speaking. They are going to be sharing the screen, so then it will change a little bit as well. Um, but uh, you still have that option to be on speaker view. You don't have to keep switching through all of the panes of, we have like five pages of little icons. So if you click on speaker view, it'll be easier for you to focus on the person that is speaking as well as the presentation that's on hand. Okay, Sikita, are you ready? Yes, I am, but if you could share the screen with Janaika so that you could put the PowerPoint up, please. Oh, yes. Awesome. And while she does that, I'll just introduce myself. So my name isn't Sikita, it's Sika, but, so, <laughs> but some of the people who, who know me well call me that sometimes. My name is Sika, um, and I'm the president of the Dominican Republic Outreach Program, formerly known as DROP, on campus. And then I'll have the rest of my team who will be helping present today also introduce themselves. So go for it. Hello everyone, my name is Melissa and I'm the Vice President of the Dominican Republic Outreach Program. I'm very excited to be here today. And whoever's next. Go for it, Franz. All right, um, my name's Franz. I'm the treasurer for DROP this year. I'm a senior and I'm a biology major. 
Hello everyone, my name is Janaika Lopez. I am an incoming senior at Florida Gulf Coast studying public health and I serve as the secretary for the Dominican Republic Outreach Program and I'm just um, excited to be in this space and to just have open conversations with everyone here. And then the other person that's on the screen is Alicia Day and she'll be attending later, but she's not here currently. And then, um, Lisa said it herself already, but she's one of our advisors as well as Matthew Ryan. So we're super thankful to have them. Um, and Lisa already mentioned it earlier when she was talking about um, the standards of today's discussion. However, some things that I'll add to that is that in this time that we're sharing right here, we understand that people, everyone in this call is coming from a different walk of life, a different background, a different experience. Um, a different education level, but at the end of the day, we're here just to grow as individuals, hear each other out, um, and grow. So some of the objectives that we'll have written later, um, they're just general to kind of set a platform of what to expect, but at the end of the day, we understand that everyone's going to get out of this um, what, in a sense, they listen and put into it, but also to what individually they're expecting or ready to do so. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and begin. So Janika, on you. Go ahead, Francie. So we would just want to begin uh, and take a few moments and dedicate a minute of silence for the people who have passed. Uh, uh, either during these protests, prior to the protests, and really during any times where uh, people were fighting for rights and have fallen in terms of uh, uh, losing their lives. Alrighty, thank you everyone. Okay, so we're gonna go over some of the objectives. So today we wanna create a brave space where people feel um, open and honest to share. And so the reason why we put brave and safe is that we understand these are extremely tough topics to talk about. However, they need to be talked about in order for us to grow and move forward as a society, as a community, um, and as a nation. So brave, to emphasize, if you feel that there's something on your heart that you need to share in order to add substance to this space, go ahead and do that. But we also understand that a lot of people are also here to listen. But remember that this is your time to share, especially if you're in this talk as a student. Um, we also want everyone to understand what personal privilege looks like. We want to discuss important topics that force people to think about ways they can bring about change in their communities and in their hearts. And we wanna provide students, faculty, staff, and community members with ways that they can take action. So there's a lot of material that we're gonna cover, but more so it's an open space of discussion. So just please, please, please feel free to share and speak up whenever you feel inclined to. And um, if you do have something to say, just go ahead and message it in the open chat and then we'll say, okay, Franz, you said I, go for it, you can speak. So if you have something you want to say at any point during any of this, please feel free to stop us and let us know so that we can continue add, adding to the conversation. Okay, so I'd like to start off by talking about privilege. Um, I went, when I was told that I was supposed to give this slide, I decided, even though I do feel like I'm pretty familiar with privilege and I consider myself to be a person of privilege in this country. Um, I decided to look deeper into it and to learn like on my own, but to also be able to express like what I think we could do as a society, what we could do as a community at FGCU. And to me, the word privilege stands for um, 
unearned advantages that some people get and others don't, whether it's because of their race, whether it's because of their religion, their backgrounds, their ethnicity. And I wanna give some examples of privilege and I'd like to just keep it to what's going on right now, just because it's with everything going on. Um, I wanna give an example of privilege with uh, the protest that involved the anti-lockdown when it was majority um, white people that were protesting they were out on the streets with guns. Um, they were getting in officers' faces, yelling at them um, with guns, walking around, entering restaurants, entering um, grocery stores, and yet one, not one person died because of that. Um, not one person got tear gas like um, they have. And I wanted to compare it to what's going on right now with the protests that started with um, the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement going on in today. And um, even in my hometown, Naples, uh, I was looking at lives, I was looking at videos of people putting their phones in somebody's face, a white person putting their phone in a person of color's face and she knocked it down and she got arrested for robbery. Um, I wanna get, I've seen people getting tear gas just for, um, you know, expressing their rights, which we should have in this country because we have freedom of speech for giving their freedom of speech, getting tear gas, getting arrested. I know a photographer got arrested for taking pictures and he, uh, the police officer told him to walk to the sidewalk and I guess he didn't walk fast enough. So he got arrested and in the video it shows them asking, why are you arresting him? And the officer saying, I don't know why. And I kind of want to explain how that shows privilege in comparison of people of color to um, privileged people here in this country. Um, it shows that no matter how far, like how long ago, like when Martin Luther King Jr. died, like we're in 2020 and uh, people of color, um, black lives are still being oppressed um, just because of the color of their skin. Uh, I'd also like to talk about um, how it's viewed in media. Um, when you see a, pers a white person get convicted of a crime, it doesn't affect, they don't put the whole race out. They say, oh, um, this person did this, but he was an amazing football player at the University of Florida. Yet, when you speak about a black person committing a crime, it automatically goes and it's like, it's the whole race. Like, oh, this black person killed someone. Okay, so now all black people um, kill, kill, like, are gonna kill somebody. And I wanted to, it's, it's something that like really bothers me and it's something that I really want to be changed. And that's why I'm very happy that I was given this um, slide because I want you all, I feel like everybody in this call right now, that you, we all have different levels of privilege. Um, some have it better than others. I, for example, can pass as a white person. So my privilege reaches a certain point, but the moment I start speaking Spanish as a Latina, it goes down. Um, and before I go on to how you use your privilege, I want everybody to just take a few seconds and think um, how you're privileged here in America. Um, how have you seen your privilege in America? Just a couple seconds. Um, so after that, uh, I want everyone, the first thing I feel like should be done to use your privilege, however you think your privilege is here in this country, um, is acknowledge it. Acknowledge the privilege that you have in comparison to others. Acknowledge that you can say what you want to say when your friend possibly can't. You can say whatever you want to say to one person, you can get in somebody's face, but your friend that's a person of color cannot. Acknowledge your privilege um, before you continue to move forward with using it. Um, vote for legislative changes. Um, a privilege that a lot of us have is that we get to vote. We get, we have the right to vote when there's a lot of people in this country that because of um, legal processes, they don't have the right to vote. Vote for those people that cannot vote because a lot of those people that feel so angered, they can't even make a change because they can't take the step into voting. Um, educate yourselves and educate others around you. Uh, I'm very big on coming from, my parents are, came from Cuba when I was, I came from Cuba when I was three and my dad came before and being in this country, he's been in this country for like 17 years now, I think 18 years. 
and still to this day like he sees stuff, everything going on like in the media and he and my parents are still asking me questions because you know I'm more technically in that subject I'm more educated and by telling them you're teaching them so that they can teach others and those others that they're teaching they're going to be teaching others it become it like becomes a chain of everybody that you're teaching um I personally feel like we need to do our part in educating ourselves because people of color don't have to explain anything to you like you live in a country where you can go on your computer and you can learn about what happened in history. You can learn about what's happening now. You can educate yourselves in that aspect. And I'd also just like to wrap it up. Um, use your voice. Don't be afraid to use your voice. You have the privilege of speaking. You have the privilege of having a voice. There's a lot of people that don't have that privilege. Use your voice and don't be afraid to get uncomfortable. Don't be afraid to, to teach others. Don't be afraid to stand out for what is right. And don't, don't just stop now. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm already seeing on social media that it's not trending. The Black Lives Matter movement isn't trending. But um, continue it. Don't let that stop trending. Make a trend in your home when you have kids. Make a trend with your, um, your significant other when you get married or when you're in a relationship. Teach others. And continue to use your privilege and speak for those that can't speak. Yeah, Melly, that was super great. And something that I want to add to that is like, people recognize their privilege at younger age. And like the reason why this picture in this slide is here, it's a picture that really stands out to me is that people of color and African Americans, like they have different lessons that they are taught when they're kids. They're, there are different lessons that they are taught when they're kids. And it's like, it's done for good reason. And an example of privilege would be one time I was driving in the car with my brother and it was his friend in the driver's seat. She was a white female and he was the black passenger and I was in the back seat and she got pulled over. We didn't know why. And the cop comes to the window. He knocks on the window and he's like, let me, he, he knocks on my brother's window and he's like, let me see your, let me see your license and let me, let me see your information. What, what's your name? And then she looks over and she's like, excuse me, sir, but I'm the one driving. And he's like, I didn't ask you. Let me see. Let me see his license. And it's like, it was a white cop. And it's like, I remember sitting in the back seat, like, you know, like what's going on. And in that moment, she was like, sir, but like, I'm driving. I'll give you my license. I'll give you the registration. But regardless, my brother gave his license and, 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 and his name. But at the same time, it's like, why is that even being done? Is it because he's an African-American male? Is it because he's a black male? And in that moment, it's kind of like, these are the things that are always and currently happening. And it's like, I remember being a kid too. And it's like, my mom is giving my brother these, these talks. My mom is sad when my brother goes out and comes home late. Why? Because she doesn't know if my brother's going to get shot for the way that he looks like. And unfortunately, like, it's, it's the sad truth. And it's like, the moment I realized that I was different and that I had a different skin tone was when I was four years old, when I was in school, when I was in class. And I remember coming home to my mom, not understanding why I was different or why people always asked me to touch my hair or what, what was so different about me. And it was when I was in preschool, kindergarten age. And I remember my mom saying, I come home from school because I didn't understand it. And my mom put me in a private school. So I was in classrooms with people who were only white. And I happened, my family happened to be one of the only black families at that, you know, at that, at that school. And it's like, that was the age that I realized that I was different. And it's like, my mom had to buy me books. She had to buy me and my big sister books to teach us about the beauty of being African American, the beauty of our hair, the beauty of our culture. And it's like, in other households across the street, do you think they're talking about why you're beautiful, why your specific race, why your specific color is beautiful? No, and it's like, it's super hard, but it's a reality. And I would come home from class from, I remember I came home and I was crying. Why was I crying? Because I didn't have lice. I was crying because I didn't have lice and I didn't understand why it was different. And I remember them telling me like, and I remember wondering and asking like, you know, why don't I have lice? And before I even know, knew who I was or what I stood for, they were telling me in my class, oh, you're, it's because you're dirty. Black, black people are dirty. That's why they don't get lice. And as a four or five year old, like, what do you respond? What do you say? What was I to say? I didn't know who I was. I didn't. And it's like, my mom had to teach me at the age, no, sweetie, you're not dirty. It's because of this, this, and this. And in nursing school last week, one of my peers asked me, 
wait, do African Americans not have lice because they're dirty? And it's like, wait, you're 22 years old and you've never looked that up, right? And you're a nursing student at a university in one of the best nursing programs in the state. And these are the questions that you're asking your peers. And it's extremely sad because from the age of four to the age of 21, where I'm sitting right now, I'm still having to educate my peers when they too have the liberty to look these questions up on their own. So it's like, we're having different talks. We're having different conversations. My brother, my mom is making sure my brother's hair is cut neat. And you know, now he has, he has um, locks, but when she could, and when she, when he was younger, it was making sure he was the perfect little black boy with perfect square cut, you know, polo shirt, nice pants, making sure she, he, he fit, he fit the model of what a nice clean cut black individual should look like. But that isn't fair. You know, why can't he dress the way that he wants to? And so I think that this is extremely powerful because it's like there's so many different conversations that are had in different households and the lessons that I grew up on. And I know that a lot of my peers, people of color grew up on are extremely different from, you know, white Americans. And it's 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 super tough, but it's like these are the things we go through. These are the things we go through. And I think it's important that you understand, like why don't the conversations look a little similar, you know? Why aren't white Americans talking to their kids about, hey, you know, you're four years old, but by the way, you know, African Americans don't get lice that often because, because, you know, why is it that my mama teaching me this, but my friend wasn't being taught that as well. So it's about teaching your kids from a young age. And I don't have children myself, but it's like, if I, when I do, hopefully I will. And I have also had the opportunity of working at the FRC and it's like, I remember one time I was there and I was playing with a little girl, a white little girl, and she had to be preschool age, she was four. And I put two, I, she had two dolls, baby dolls she was playing with. And one of them was black and one of them was white. And I handed them both of her. I wasn't doing like an experiment or anything. I just handed her the little dolls and then she moved the black doll away. And then in my head, I'm like, Wait, wait, I just asked her, you know, she's a little girl. I was like, oh, wait, why do you want to play with that one? You wanted two. And she's like, well, I don't like that one. And she's four. And I was like, oh, like, what's wrong? Like, why don't you like that one? Like, what's wrong with that one? Hmm, I don't like that one. My mom doesn't buy that one. I don't like that one. This one's prettier. And she's pointing at the white belt. Like, this one's prettier. And in my head, I'm like, wow, this starts young. This starts really young. And I remember telling her, like, no, they're both beautiful. They're both baby dolls. One just has a darker skin color, but they're both beautiful. They're still babies. And she's like, yeah, but I don't like that one. And it's like, I tried to do my part and I talked to her a little bit, but again, it's like, that means in her household, that's what she's hearing. That's what she's seeing. That's what she's being taught. Why aren't her toys diverse too? So it's, these are the questions that you have to think about. Um, because in my household and people who look like me, these are the conversations that we have. Um, Clarissa has something to say. Hi, so sorry you can't see me. My video wasn't working for some reason. But I just want to say, I feel like, like, I'm, I feel like I'm privileged for a lot of reasons, but like the two main reasons being, one, I'm white, and also my mom's just, she's educated me and my siblings, I feel like more than a lot of, like, white Americans than most families have to just to understand like that there are differences for African Americans and white children growing up like th that aren't fair. And I don't know, I feel like more so than like, I, it's weird because when I go to talk to other people that are just ignorant that are white, like even on Facebook, I ran into this argument with a girl just trying to educate her and because she was saying that white privilege, oh, I'm not privileged, like I've had my own struggles. And I was like, yeah, that's not what white privilege is though. Like white privileges, yes, you've had your own struggles, but your struggles aren't because of your skin color. And she just kind of wrote me off. And I, sometimes I'm like, when, when is it my time to like step in and try to say something? But at the same time, like, I don't know what to do when people, I don't, I, sometimes I feel like people's minds just won't be changed. And I don't know what to do at that point. Something that I'll comment on that, Clarissa, is I under I can totally understand where you're coming from, but it's also too about understanding that it's not about changing someone's mind. It's about planting that seed. It's at least that you used your voice in a place where you were privileged enough to do so. Um, so 
So a lot of times you can't get to someone, you can't change how they think about things, but you can still plant the seed and you can still know that you used your voice and you did what you could and you did what was in your power to make a change in that moment. Because people aren't going to listen. People aren't going to listen, but you still can do what you can. But good point. So I feel that it can be super difficult. And I know there's different people who come in this or, or who in this space right now might be in different places. So it's like there's some people right now who are super angry with everything going on. There's some people who are tired, who are tired of seeing another person in the news, another person being killed because of their skin color. But wherever you are, it starts at an individual level, level wherever you are. And there's always something that we don't know. There's always something that we don't know. So it's about educating yourself. It's not about relying on your black friend to teach you about it. It's about looking these things up on your time and seeing and educating yourself enough to know what you don't know. And it's also too about speaking up, kind of like how Clarissa mentioned. It's like, if you're in a specific space where people are saying things that shouldn't be said or you don't understand, speak up and use your voice because it's a privilege to have a voice and to be able to speak up. Um, and a lot of people don't do it. And it's like at FGCU, like I remember walking behind a group of people, um, white individuals, and they're talking and they're using the N-word, just throwing it around like it's just another, another, another word, another term. And it's like, that's offensive and that's rude. And it's like, I was like, excuse me, but do you mind not using that term? It's inappropriate. And some of them snickered, but one of them was like, yo, bro, like stop, like you need to stop. And it's like, yeah, they laughed. Yeah, I might have looked some way just speaking out like that, but it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Like it was something that had to be done. And regardless of whether it has to do with race, if someone's being treated unjust, you need to speak up, you need to use your voice. And it doesn't matter what you look like. And also by not saying anything, you're being a bystander. Another thing that's important is on the communal level. So it's about regardless of where your community is or whatever specific communities you identify, not only is it about using your voice, but as voice, it's also about making a change in your community if you see fit or if you see that something needs to be done differently. So um, there are a lot of digital e-petitions going around. Sign a petition if you stand for the cause. It only takes a few seconds. Vote in your community. It's not about just voting on a presidential level. It's about voting in your community, voting locally, um, voting for state legislator, le legislature. So there are many steps on doing it, but on the individual level, it's about taking that initiative to make a difference, whether it be individual, communal, or whatever. And if you know that you're someone who's well off and you have money, like make donations. And even if you're not and you just feel called or it's in your heart or you're in the right place or you just got an extra bonus or something, like make a donation to a cause that's important you know, and be vulnerable in spaces. It's hard to have these conversations, but if you don't allow people to know the hardships that you're going through, it's hard for them to have a change of heart because all they, it's, it's not personal anymore. It's not personal, but once it's like in your backyard, once it's your friend, it changes the narrative of the conversation. So it's kind of like, don't be afraid to be vulnerable and let people know what you're going through because that's a lot of times when you know, change occurs. And a lot of people need to hear your personal experience and all, in order to make a difference, especially a lot of people who have become complacent in the fact that this is something that always goes on. This always happens, this and that, but it should never be that. We should never be complacent in things that are unjust and that are wrong. So it's about allowing yourself to be vulnerable in order to make a space for people to grow in order to make, allow people to ask you these questions. And it's like, educate yourself educate yourself know the names of the people that this ha this happened to hold yourself as well as others accountable you know call for action all of these things i love this little this little picture because it, it explains a lot of um little things and i see that tonight go on to speak so hi everyone i just wanted to say a little something on the topic of vulnerability um, last night I met with a couple of my chapter sisters and my advisor, and although, like, I'm one of the only sisters within my chapter that identifies as Black, I was still able to see vulnerability from my other sisters and my advisor, and we all kind of shared our experiences within everything that's going on, and it kind of opened my eyes up to what they might be facing. Like, we have a sister who's, um, she, she identifies as Asian, and she kind of shared with me kind of, like, the anti- 
blackness that they experience within Asian culture and how she faces that at home and how she's dealing with it and just opening conversations with that and going back to vulnerability. Um, it's not just people of color and black people who need to be vulnerable. It is, it's nice to be vulnerable on both ends, whether you're white or identify as white, just seeing vulnerability from all aspects from everyone. And if you're afraid to be vulnerable, like that's okay. Like not everyone's used to using their voice or to sharing their personal, um, sharing their personal experiences, but it's about taking the first step to be vulnerable. Like I remember the first time that I was vulnerable, it became so easy to reach that point and to be open with people as open as I need to be and kind of just asking to respect that. Although I may be sharing um, parts of my life with you that it kind of stays within that space. Like I'm sharing my experiences with you for you to understand, but not for you to necessarily take these stories and share them, share the lessons that you learn from my experiences, but don't necessarily share my story is what I'm getting at. Exactly. And um, also too, with that is like, even with becoming vulnerable, it might be uncomfortable, but it's what's necessary. And two years ago, I attended Leadership Academy or Leadership, um, one of them, and there was a speaker and it was Dr. Thornhill and he spoke about the different things going on in race and his class on campus. And I remember after that, um, a peer of mine who was white spoke to us at the lunch table and was like oh like this is so uncomfortable like that made me feel so uncomfortable I, I don't I don't like stuff like this like that made me feel so uncomfortable it shouldn't have been presented that way he shouldn't have posted those pictures like that shouldn't have been shown and I remember sitting at that lunch table just feeling like I'm someone who doesn't get very very angry often but I remember sitting there getting very angry getting very frustrated and I remember I opened my mouth and I was like what do you mean like you know like how you feel right now, the discomfort that you feel right now is how people feel every day. It's how I felt in certain spaces in my life every single day. And it's like the fact that you feel that for 30 minutes you can't be uncomfortable says a lot about your character and about who you are. These are topics that have to be spoken about. And of course, they're uncomfortable. But in order for us to grow, in order for these things to happen, like you have to understand within yourself, why do you even feel uncomfortable? What, what about this is making you feel uncomfortable? And it just really frustrated me because it's like, just because you feel uncomfortable doesn't mean the conversation needs to stop. These conversations can be uncomfortable, but it's personal experiences. It's things that people have gone through. It's things that people feel like we're real people kind of thing. And it's like, I feel uncomfortable sometimes as the only black person in my class, as the only black person in my table, as the, one of the three only black individuals in the nursing program in my cohort. It's uncomfortable sometimes. Because when I'm not learning about what these conditions and diseases look like in my skin tone and people who are darker than white, it's very hard and very frustrating for me because it's like, I'm not becoming a nurse to treat one race, one demographic. I'm becoming a nurse to treat all people and to help those around me. So why am I not being taught that? And it's uncomfortable when I have to be the only one. Hey, by the way, what does this look like in someone with my skin tone? It's uncomfortable, but it has to be done. So just kind of, in a sense, Check yourself, check yourself, check yourself, because it, it can be a tough conversation, but they're ones that have to be had. Um, just going off some of the comments that I see in the chat. So from Gervais, we see education is so important. We all have to be able to normalize changing our opinion when presented with new information, but check the validity, validity of that information, ask questions and be informed. So yes, thank you for that, Jean. And right under that, we have Savannah. Um, what is the difference for a white person between speaking up and speaking for people of color? Um, Savannah, uh, I can comment on that. And then if anyone else wants to comment on that, and I'm opening up the floor for anyone um, after that, feel free to or leave a comment in the chat box so you can. So Savannah, what I'm, from what I'm understanding of your question of the difference for a white person between speaking up and speaking for people of color, like, just to start off, you should never be speaking for people of color. Like, I don't know if that's what you meant by that, but a, something that the experiences that people of color have in this country is their experience. You're never, as a white person, if you identify as white, are gonna be able to speak on that experience. Now, like I said, say if I'm, I'm a person of color and I'm sharing my experience with you, you might learn a lesson from that. You might learn, exactly how I'm feeling emotionally because of the experiences that I'm having. 
and you might reflect on that internally and kind of come up with your own thought process on everything that's going on and from there if you're learning like a lesson from my experiences then like I said share those experiences but never speak for a person of color we have voices and we want to use them there are just some times where we are in situations where our voices are not heard or we're speaking like as Sika shared in her nursing program on multiple occasions she's had to share that you know these diseases are not only present in white people they're present in people of color but sometimes she's just shied away and nothing ever you might feel like nothing's ever getting changed but again like she's speaking in spaces like my words are kind of getting lost but that's what I'm trying to say like just never speak for people of color and in terms of speaking up as a white person I can't tell you what that looks like because I'm not white but I can tell you um just going back to some of the things that we've kind of talked about here is like breaking your silence, just like look at the screen, like holding other accountables, condemning all forms of racism, calling out racist comments or jokes or stereotypes. Like that's something that you can do to speak up against some of the things that, you know, people, you know what's right and what's wrong. You know that a racist joke is my, not even, it's not even funny. Like a racist joke is not funny. And if you're hearing it and you're in a community or in a group of friends that they're making these jokes, like speak up against it, check that person if you feel like you need to check that person. So, and that's all I have. Um, I know under that we have Nikki said, I remember that trip Sika and it was so powerful. I'm just grateful that you spoke up and said something to that student. It is a good thing he was there and getting exposed to that situation. Hopefully it planted the, this planted the seed as you said before. And then under that we have Melissa. If you wanna go ahead and comment, Melissa. Yeah, I kind of wanna comment on like on what you were talking about, Ja. Uh, Completely agree with you. You should never speak for people of color because you we have not experienced what they have experienced. But as for speaking up for them, uh, don't be afraid to speak up for them. Stand your ground. I mean, I can give an example that wasn't even here in America. It was when we were in the Dominican Republic with Drop. We were playing basketball. I remember it was Sika, um, me. Oh, I'm trying to remember who else. But like the it was primarily oh Danielle, and it was primarily like between Sika and I. And um, these random guys came to like join the court with the kids that we were playing with and they were picking a team and like, they just kept pointing at, at the black people that were like with drop and they're like to seek they're like, tu negra, like you come with me. And for most of you that know, Dominican people are also black just for some reason. Um, they don't like to admit to it. They don't like to, they like to say that they're light skinned, but they're black too. And, and I was in Spanish because at that moment, Sika, she speaks good Spanish, but she couldn't really like stand up for herself in that moment. I was like, no, you're black too. Like her name is Sika and you can call her by her name. Like, and they continue to say it. And like, well, as the game kept continuing, like I, I was starting to get angry and like, I wouldn't stop. Like it got to a point where I didn't stop. And I remember it was really interesting because by the end of the game, none of those guys were calling Sika Negra. They were calling like Sika like Tu because they didn't remember her name, but they were not calling her Negra. And like, you can t tell somebody, you can speak up for people of color right now and that same person's gonna continue to disrespect them. So don't stop, like continue to like, like be, you can be harsh. Like you can like tell them what's up. Like don't be afraid to tell them what's up and like continue it. Like it really, it's very infuriating that like, um, to see that like somebody, oh yeah, that, that black girl, oh, you know, that, like that pretty black girl. No, her name is Janaika. Her name is Miranda. Like, I don't know, like correct people, correct people when they're wrong, because that's called being ignorant and do not allow ignorance around you, especially if you know that you can speak up for it. Thank you, Melly. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, um, and thank you so far for everyone who has shared or um, stated something in the comments or asked a question, continue to do so. Um, so what we wanna move towards is protesting. So um, protesting is something that's always happened in the United States, but um, because of the unfortunate death of George Floyd, um, it's resurfaced and a lot of people are protesting um, currently. So some things that we wanted to talk about is protesting and, and what that looks like. Protesting, rioting, looting. Protesting is a right. 
we have a right under our First Amendment to assemble um, and to express ourselves. So as long as we're protesting peaceful, we're marching, we're chanting, that is okay. But anything that becomes, you know, violent or to another level is no longer considered protesting. But it's one of our rights to assemble, to express, to talk, to chant. Um, and that's something I think people need to understand and people need to know. Like, what people are doing is not wrong. It's a form of expression. It's a form of expression. It's not wrong. Protesting is protesting. And everything that doesn't fall under that gap or that loop or that bubble is no longer protesting. So if you are going to go to a protest, we just have a few things that we wanted to write. So um, I've gone to a few myself since this has all started. And the biggest thing is safety. You know, be vigilant. If you're going to a protest, be vigilant about what's going on around you because you never know what can happen. You don't know the people that you're around, around so make sure that you're staying safe. And it is still COVID-19, so make sure that you're wearing masks and that you're taking the necessary precautions. And it's also very important to, if you can, I know it's Florida, I know it's hot, but wear long sleeves and long pants if you can, because um, if something happens and pepper spray or chemicals are thrown, by allowing yourself to not be uncovered, you're at risk for getting hurt and for getting an injury. And pepper spray, it's a specific chemical that interacts with fluid and moisture on our bodies. And that is why it is so effective. So when they spray it in their eyes, the reason why it's reacting is because we have fluid and moisture in our eyes. So if you're someone who wears glasses um, or contacts, wear glasses instead of contacts because contacts are going to make pepper spray even worse in your eyes because it's going to attach to the fluid and the chemicals and really like affect, affect um, your eyes. And then also too, something that is very good against pepper spray is if you have a cloth or a rag, soak it in water, soak it in milk and put it around your face. So it's going to help from a lot. It's the chemicals are gonna get caught on the rag instead of inside of your body. So just cover your face with that if anything like that does happen. And at the protest that I was at, we were walking, we were walking, and then I looked down all the way to the right and there was someone passed out on the floor. And I wasn't close enough to get there, but he passed out because of heat exhaustion, because it's hot and you're walking and you're sweating and you're yelling and you're screaming. Um, you might be anxious or whatever. So just make sure that you're drinking enough water, that you're walking with water, um, that you're taking care of yourself. And it's like, there were a lot of people at the protests that were walking around with coolers. There were people who brought waters, different companies and stuff that, that were making sure that people had water and that people were drinking. So just make sure that you're taking care of yourself so that you don't pass out due to heat exhaustion. And then also make sure to check the validity of the protest. And you know, for me, the protest that I was attending, it was from three to six, that was the time. It was from three to six. And at 5.55 or 5.50, my brother was like, okay, like let's head out now. And so we left and I had a few friends who stayed and the image that was going viral on social media of the cop pushing the black girl who was kneeling happened after we left. And after that happened and, and that began, it was after the time of the protest. And it's like, I'm thankful that we left once the organized protest you know, ended because then I would have been caught up in that with my little cousins and with my family and who knows what would have happened. So it's like, just be, be aware of your surroundings, um, understand that anything can happen and that, that going to a protest is a high risk situation, even though it shouldn't be. Even though you're, you're, you're doing your right of walking and marching and expressing yourself, it's still a super high risk. So just be very aware of the things that are around you, wear your mask, long sleeves if you can, um, and just be careful. Does anyone have anything that they wanna add to this slide? Okay, if not, we can go ahead and move on, but just keep that in mind when protesting. So moving into the topic of self-care, um, with everything that's going on, I know personally for me, it has taken a toll on me mentally, and I'm taking summer classes right now, and sometimes I get distracted from my schoolwork because I'm scrolling through social media and I'm seeing the same videos over and over and over again and kind of feeling so many things and I'm not really sure sometimes what to feel and sometimes I just want to feel numb to all of it, but then I feel like I can't be numb to all of it. So it's very, I know personally from my, from my experience, it's just, it's just overwhelming. So we wanted to include something that self-care tips for racial trauma. And so 
spend time with those you don't have to turn off the news write down your thoughts and emotions in a journal lean on the strength of your advocates and unfollow accounts who aren't supporting social justice i mean sorry aren't supporting racial justice and just going from this like again this list of tips is not exhaustive like there are many more things that you can be doing to take care of yourself self-care is it varies from the individual i know for me i've just taken a break from all social media spending a lot more time with family not really engaging in a lot of conversations about specifics of the protests and everything just because it just triggers so much within me so i just kind of like try to keep conversations about a lot of things like very minimal and only engage in these conversations when I feel like I need to. And when thinking about self-care, like you have to take care of yourself before you're able to take care of others. So I know that within the black community specifically, like I want to reach out to those that I know may be feeling um, very, just a lot from everything that's going on. And then there's a bunch of other things going on within our personal lives that extend beyond the present events that are going on within this country. And, but I need to make sure that I'm able to take care of myself first, because if I'm not in a right mental state, like I can't go and help the people that I want to help or be there for the people that I want to be there for. So just make sure, and this goes for anyone, like make sure you're taking care of yourself first before you go and try to take care of someone else. Like be strong within yourself first. And again, like if anyone wants to add anything, maybe share ways that they're self, um, practicing self-care within themselves or, just any anecdotes that they want to share, like the floor is open. Go ahead. I think it's Sherita White. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. You pronounced it right. Thank you. Um, this is kind of going off of the last slide as well as like self care and just being careful. Um, I've been hearing like on Twitter, just being careful when you take pictures at protest. I know it's important to take pictures and get it out there, but not posting pictures with other people's faces that are identifiable because you're not sure what kind of people they can be around or if it's safe for them to be, um, unfortunately, if it's safe for them to be expressing those kinds of things in their environment. So just being aware when you're doing that of what you're posting on social media. That was all. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, is there anyone else, lead team or anyone else present that wants to add to this slide? All right, if not, we're gonna go ahead and move on. And I see that Ilema commented and she said, one thing that touched me was on following accounts who are not supporting racial justice. There were people I went to school with back then who are not only not supporting, but also speaking very poorly. To me, it's important to continue to surround myself with people who are pushing forward and supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and are seeking change. Thank you for sharing that, Ilema. I agree with you. Um, and thank you for catching that comment, Sika. No problem. <laughs> um, okay. So, oh my gosh, is it on timer? Yeah, it is. So a few resources that we wanted to share with you. So on the left, we have Fund Racial Justice, where to donate. And these are just a few funds that you can donate to. So again, we have the George Floyd Memorial Fund. Um, he just recently they held his funeral. So I'm not sure if this list is completely updated. Um, and Black Visions Collective, just a few. And some of these are bail funds. And on the right, we have a master doc for a document for bail funds slash legal help. And then it's organized by city. So of course this, um, this presentation will be made available to the public through our Canvas drop page. And then through Public Outreach Program, we have our own Canvas page that is available to our members and we can, we're going to be posting this um, presentation on there afterwards. And then beyond that, if there's anyone that needs to get access to this um, presentation, just reach out to anyone on the lead team. And then more on the left, um, this is, uh, something from Instagram. It's the Racial Justice Resource Guide, and it was put together by the Black Student Union from John Hopkins University. And then if you were to click on the link, once again, this presentation will be made available to you. It's literally just a guide, and it's self-explanatory. It's literally just a racial justice resource guide, and it kind of goes into that or depth about ways that students, um, the steps that students can take to 
um, educate themselves on racial justice to advocate for those and just going beyond um, or finding ways to just go beyond and just support everyone. And on the right are just a few numbers that you can call and doing these numbers or calling these numbers will be able to connect you to different, um, it's, so if you call this number, it's again, like it's a national lawyers guild, but if you go beyond, if you call the number, it can um, connect you with something more local. And with this number, you can just provide supplies and just support for people out there in the field and out at the protest. So being an anti-racist ally, um, being an anti-racist ally, again, there's a hyperlink available within there. And it just provides more tips and more ways for you to speak out against racism and literally be an anti-racist ally. And one thing I wanted to know is that to keep the momentum, remember that this is not a trend. As the news cycle moves past everything, we cannot, as Black people and as people of color, hold yourself accountable in the community you choose to surround yourself with. Um, I noticed that personally, like within social media, um, a lot of the protests and just everything are not really trending anymore. And people who were, you know, maybe really being really great advocates last week aren't really posting about it as much. And not to say that they're not still advocating, they may be doing so in other ways, but a lot of the things are losing traction. And I just want to make sure that even though like it's not on social media as much, it doesn't mean that this movement is any less important that it, um, than it was last week. And then Issa Thies just shared that she'll be sharing via Eagle Link the presentation. And then someone else, Gracie, pointed out that on FGCU underscore PB, the programming board Instagram, they have a highlight called resources. So I'm assuming that if you click on that highlight, you'll be able to see other resources and different ways to help. So thank you, Gracie, for that. And last thing is vote. So, and not just vote in um, the presidential election, but local, state, midterm elections, like everything. And included in here, is a Dropbox um, document that Hannah Ortega put together. She is a recent FGCU graduate and also was a member of Dominican or DROP. And she, again, within this document is just bringing attention to a few candidates running within the Southwest Florida area. But I encourage you that beyond this document to do your own research and to go beyond that. Like this was um, put together by Hannah, but she herself notes in the document that there is more to it, like it's not just this. So continue to do your research and continue to just educate yourself. So, and then I included in here just the election schedule for Florida. And then on the next slide, I also included, um, these are taken straight from Hannah's document. And again, it tells you, she highlighted for you um, the deadlines to register to vote. And then on the right, it's the deadlines and election dates for primary election and general. and it's um, separated by city. And again, this was in, within the Southwest Florida. So if you're someone like me who lives in Tampa, Florida, it isn't really helpful for me, but that doesn't mean that I can't go out there myself and easily find a date for my city. Um, just really quick, sorry to interrupt, but Autumn wants to talk about trauma porn. And <laughs> another important point is to emphasize on how non-Black allies can use their platforms and connections with friends and family to start important conversations. And then Jessica Homer wants to say that a lot of Florida decisions are made on the August ballot, not just at the primary in November. And everyone can re request a mail-in ballot if you do not use it and don't want to go in. Um, you can just return it when you get there. So Autumn is Sorry, I was hoping that um, Issa Tease would speak on that. I know you had spoken that at on that at the last meeting and I thought that was a good explanation about trauma porn. Yeah so trauma porn for those that don't know what trauma porn is it's pretty much the media feeding you um the disgusting slash um violent slash videos of people being killed constantly um, so the, watching the eight and a half minute video of George Floyd being knelt on, that's trauma porn. You having to consistently like go down this rob rabbit hole of watching these videos of people getting run over by cars, by people 
um, at protests and getting hurt, um, people watching um, Philando Castillo being shot, like all of these videos that constantly get shared, that's trauma porn. And when you indulge in that trauma porn, it causes a lot of issues mentally. It causes a lot of um, distress for your body, for your brain. It causes you not to be able to sleep. And so when you indulge in the trauma porn, um, you're taking away from real life and you're taking away from your current situation. And I say real life in your per present situations, not that those situations are not real life. Um, so, you know, what I was preaching to the students at the end of our meeting last time was to not indulge in or to not give into the trauma porn because it's so easy to just get sucked into it that you end up watching it for like an hour, two hours, three hours on end without even realizing it because you're just trying to get information. In turn, what you should do is do the research on the, on the organizations and replace it with positive things that you can do for the movement and to make progress versus watching the negative um, things that the media will portray or that Instagram accounts will share. Like Instagram is infamous for just sharing videos and sharing videos, but why are you sharing a video of somebody being killed? Share a video of information that is going to be useful for the future. Share a video or information that is going to be educational. Share or show a video of something that you can grow from versus something that you're going to experience pain and hurt and discomfort. Um, so when you opt into watching and indulging in the trauma porn, there's no good result from that. If you opt for the other things, you'll have positive and pro positivity and progress. You'll be able to be educated. You'll be able to have these conversations with your peers and with adults and with younger children um, and with elderly people that may have differing viewpoints than you. And you're able to have those crucial conversations that we need to be having on a consistent basis with the people around us. And so, you know, you have the choice to make um, to not indulge in those um, items. Um, so that's pretty much like a very layman's term synopsis of what trauma porn is and how you can choose to not indulge in it. Um, hopefully that's what you were looking for, Autumn, because I really don't remember exactly what I said last time because <laughs> my memory is here. Before. Um, I definitely think, go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. I, I definitely think you touched on it, um, especially for people who are going through those, you know, oppressions and experiencing them themselves. Um, I do think it's important for non-Black people or people who are not being oppressed in those ways to educate themselves. And um, a, a point I would like to make, not, not that trauma porn should be necessary in order to change people's minds but sometimes you know certain people who are not coming from that perspective it takes seeing such a horrible thing to make them realize um but i would not encourage people to watch it who already understand because that does inflict mental trauma yeah thank you autumn i see kelly has something to say Yeah, I just wanted to comment kind of like you're saying, Autumn, that I guess there are people who have to see it to believe it and make a difference, but you shouldn't have to believe black people when they tell you what happens to them, believe people of color when they tell you what happens to them. Like that's part of being an anti-racist is I don't have to see the video. I know it was bad. I like, I get it. And I believe you. And that's, I feel like that's part of it is you, you shouldn't have to see it to believe it. Thank you, Kelly. And so um, to continue on, these are a lot of questions, so I'm not going to sit here and read every single one to you, but I think these are some important things to think about. And I'll just talk about an experience I had last week with a professor in the nursing program. And it's kind of like, you know, with everything going on, it has been super hard for me. And it's not to say that, you know, these are things that I didn't know about or things that I've never heard of, but it's like, right now in society, these are things that are being brought to light. A lot of things that people maybe didn't experience or didn't hear before. And it's like, I emailed my professor, um, a week, a week prior to the two exams I'd be having um, last Tuesday. 
And I reached out to her and I said, um, hi, good afternoon, super formal, professional email. And I was like, you know, I understand that in the syllabus, these exams were stated that they would be on this day. I understand that it's very hard to move exams. I understand. Um, however, during this time, I'm not saying that I haven't studied for the exam. I'm not saying this, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is it's very hard for me to focus. It's very hard for me to look at my book and read about labor and delivery right now. These are topics that I love, but it's very hard for me to focus because of everything going on, because of how I'm having to sit here at night explaining to my little cousins um, what racism is or the things that are going on in the world. It's very hard for me currently. And I reached out to my professor basically as a cry for help saying, you know, is there anything that you can do for me in the situation? Is there a way that maybe I can take this exam tomorrow? You know, I just, I need a little more time to get my mind right, right? And they emailed my professor. They both emailed me back because I had two exams. And basically they, they both told me obviously, no, you know, you can't have an extension. But instead of personally taking initiative to deal with the situation, they just referred me to the CAPS. And not that CAPS isn't a great re resource, it is, and I've used it. However, it's like you have, instead of taking initiative to personally talk to me and ask me how I'm doing, you deferred that job and that role to someone else. Just because you can't give me an extension doesn't mean, hey, Sika, can can, do you want to talk? Can we talk about it? Is there anything else I can do? And I just feel like as a professor and as a faculty member, there's so many different things and, and different resources that you can use in order to help your students. But instead of helping your students, are you just referring them to someone else? And it's like, that was an opportunity that my professor had to use her platform in order to make a difference, in order to help me. And it's not like I'm a student who doesn't show up to class on time, who doesn't do my work. You know, I'm a student who has had, I've, I've, I speak up in my classroom when nobody, and even in these Zoom calls, when nobody in my class wants to speak, I'm the one speaking. When they're asking questions, I'm the one answering. On the exams, I'm the one doing extremely well. Like I'm a student who goes out of my way to speak up, not only because I want to or because I love nursing what I'm learning, but also because as one of the few or only black person in my, my college, in my school and, and the nursing program, like, it's almost like when I started, I felt it was my responsibility and it was added pressure, which it shouldn't be. But in my head, it's like, if I don't speak, who's going to speak? Who's going to speak for the people that look like me? And it's like frustrating because it's like my professors, they know who I am. They know I'm a student who cares about what I'm learning. I've always cared about my academics. And yet in that moment, they just deferred the responsibility to someone else. And it's like, as faculty and staff members, are you using your privilege to be in your position? Are you, are you using your privilege in order to stand up for students and to speak to students about the things that are going on. My professor didn't even acknowledge what I said. They completely disregarded it and said, no, if I do this for you, I have to do it for everyone. But then I have a question for my professor. Is everyone in my program going through this? Name me the other, you know, person of color or the other black female student who's probably going through the struggle. And it's very frustrating because it's like you have to understand that, you know, people individually have issues that they're going through. And I think that was something that really hurt me in a sense, because it's like you think you have, you know, relationships. And I understand the quotas and the stuff that, you know, it's hard. You know, there's different things, the validity of the exam, I get it. But it's also to like take your initiative on the individual level to speak to the students in your class, because we're people on on the side, you know what I'm saying? And I'm doing my best to finish nursing school and do well. But. I would appreciate in that moment if they offered a helping hand, as simple as that. And so a lot of these questions came to my mind because I think they're important questions to ask yourself, you know. Is your curriculum diverse? Do you use inclusive language when you're speaking in class? Do your students know that they can come to your office hours aside from academic purposes? Do you think that they'd be comfortable to do so? And do you care for them to come? Do you affirm them on their accomplishments? You know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do in these positions because you deal with students hands on often. So it's like, are you using your privilege and your position, whatever that may look like at FGCU in order to make, you know, that difference? Um, and I think it's super important because you deal with students often. And for me, that's something that hurts. And after my exam, you know, I did my best. I did what I could. But after my exam, like, 
my results came back and I got the lowest grade that I've ever gotten in my university experience in my entire and I am someone who had has had I've I got the lowest grade I've ever had in my university experience and it's like they had the opportunity to help and I'm not saying that I couldn't have done more or whatever it may be I'm just saying like they had the opportunity to stick up for me and they did it and I don't regret the conversation I had with my little cousin about why her hair is beautiful and why it's okay that it's big. I don't regret reading to my little cousins about the fact that black people are necessary and about all the achievements that they did. Because the talks that my mom had to have with me are the talks that I'm having with my little cousins instead of studying for my nursing exam. So keep in mind the struggles that students are going through. And although your faculty and staff remember that you all have lives, but so do we, and it can be hard sometimes. So that's just an experience that I'm sharing, and I see that people are messaging in the chat. So, um, Zika, before you go, I have a private message that because there was a Wi-Fi connection issue, and I have a person um, that's asking that they're going to be in an RA next year, and they want to be as inclusive as possible, but they're wondering if anyone had any ideas for this because she knows that some RAs who are also people of color were not happy with how some other RAs were addressing this last year and she wants to be able to do better this next year. What's so, she's the question? For, so she's looking for program and conversation ideas like how to combat you know like if somebody's saying something negative or you know what are some programmatic ideas that she can host right, to okay for the, for um, students. yeah um and so that i think that's a really good question and i would say one first recognize within yourself um how you feel about these conversations but also to use the resources that you have um so especially on campus as an ra so um, I'm also a multicultural ambassador um, at FGCU, and all the things that we do are host programs that talk about these specific conversations, whether it be microaggressions, privilege, um, whatever the conversation may be. So if you want to reach out to me and maybe I can talk with my MAPS team and we can maybe host an event for the RAs and speak about stuff like that and topics like that, or if not, um, there's many resources on campus um, that can give information and resources on how to be inclusive and diverse in language. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, as a follow-up, she was just saying that she wants to make sure that people of color feel represented and that she's not overstepping as someone who is not a person of color. Mm -hmm. um, and then Janaika, you had something that you wanted to say, you had I up there. Um, first, to speak to the individual question, I remember my freshman year, um, here at FGCU at the hall, and I was the only black person on my hall, and everyone else was white, and I recognized that, and it was apparent to me, but that's because, like, of course it's going to be apparent to me, like, I'm the only person that looks like me on my floor, but I never felt that I was, um, my RA did a very good job at, you know, being inclusive, and it wasn't, um, I was lucky because my RA was a person of color as well, so, but the way that she made me feel included was not to, I never felt singled out in anything. Um, when we had events, there was events that, you know, everyone um, could participate in. So around Halloween, she had a pumpkin carving um, event, and that was an event that everyone on the floor could participate in. And around the holidays, like, she didn't have, like, a Christmas event. Like, she had a um event that was that wasn't like specific to any holiday um i'm not an ra so i was i can't offer you like any like um strict advice on it i've only heard from some experiences of having friends as ras and i know that one of the concerns that i've heard is that ra diversity training takes place on one day and i know like as students we we talk i remember like one of the concerns is that diversity training takes place in one day for all ras but there's so many levels of diversity, like why isn't this a continuing thing? Like every month they have some type of diversity training and try to not limit the experiences of marginalized people on our campus and just within this world in one day, but making it maybe mandatory or people seeking out um, their own resources to make sure that they're being educated on these topics, not just in one day, but beyond that. Um, and then the I that I put down in the chat was just to talk about um, some of my experiences like on campus, like trying, just going off of what Sika said, 
um, like related to faculty and staff. I know like there's been times on this campus where as a black student, I felt like there'd be times where I'm literally like, do I shake this person's hand? Like if they weren't like, if they're like white or something like, oh my gosh, what if they don't want to shake my hand? Like that's literally gone through my head being here at FTCU. And coming from where I come from, like I was born in Miami, but lived majority of my life in Tampa. And to me, like these are very diverse cities. Like I've never had to deal with them being one of like, even in my, the schools that I went to, like it was pretty diverse and coming to this campus, that was the first time that I ever really realized that I'm a black girl and people are going to recognize me as a black girl before they see anything else about me. And I didn't feel that until I came to FTCU. I spent 18 years of my life not experiencing that. And luckily for me, I found communities on campus like MLD, like Dominican Republic Outreach Program that allowed me to feel like I had a voice and people weren't just seeing me as a black girl, they were seeing me beyond that. And as faculty and staff, like kind of recognize that yes, the majority of the students that you might be teaching are white, but recognize when you're giving these lessons um, that you have students of color within your classes and everything. And this goes for virtual classes as well. I know it's a little bit harder, but just recognize that, like take time out of your day if you can to just reach out to those students in times like this. Like I remember as a freshman when I did film appreciation, we watched, I was the only black girl in that class and there was over, I think like 50 kids in that class. And we watched, every week we watched a different film and one week we watched it and the film was on racial injustices and, or racial, racial injustices and, I don't even know if I'm saying that word correctly, sorry. And I remember the, we always watched the film and, and then did discussion within the whole class and I was always sharing. I remember that one day I did not want to share because the film was specifically about how black people were treated within this country. And then nobody wanted to share. Uh, like every single week I shared and that one week where I was like, I really do not feel like sharing um, or participate, participating in class discussion in this, like this, I just don't feel like it. And then that was the first day that the professor decided to call on me to share my experience and my discussion for the film. And I remember just feeling so put on the spot for it. And it's like, my black experience is not the same as a student next to me. Like black experiences differ. Like I am a black Latina, like my experience completely differs. Like I have privilege being a black Latina. People see my last name and treat me different. That's why when I came to this campus, a lot of times I don't even tell people I'm Hispanic because they treat me better in a sense when they find out that I'm not just African American. Um, and it's, disgusting in a sense and I take note of the people who are like that and I try to distance myself from people like that but it happens on this campus and just because you may not see it and you have the privilege of not experiencing it it doesn't mean that it's not an issue. Thank you Janika. Bronce you had something? Yeah sorry I was trying to unmute myself. You're fine. So uh, I was also going to answer the RA question. I think one of the most important steps is reaching out and having the humility to admit that you don't necessarily have all of the answers. And it's not necessarily an intelligence thing, but it's a question of backgrounds. So being and identifying as an immigrant uh, is very different, even so because a lot of people will assume that I'm either African-American or for some other place. And once they hear me speak English and they uh, hear my accent, it kind of throws them off. I think part of being diverse and having your inclusion is being able to admit that you don't necessarily have those answers and being in places like this, forums like this. And I think one of the, a lot of resources were mentioned by Sika and those are really good, but one of the best resources is the people you're trying to reach themselves. So if you have specific students that live in a dorm and you're trying to have them feel included, all you have to do is ask. Of course, now how you ask is gonna be very important. You should be very mindful of how you ask so that they don't feel singled out. But something that would be uh, interesting is asking them what they would like as an event, but also asking everybody else so they don't feel necessarily singled out and not necessarily asking as a black person, how would you like to feel included? Because that's a very charged question, but rather what are some of your interests and what are some things you think would bring diversity to the floor? What are some topics that you think would help? 
and in reaching out to somebody based on their interests, they're more likely to answer and give you good suggestions rather than having a very charged topic like race or diversity and asking such a specific charged question, rather asking what are some things you like that I could include in my program and based on the backgrounds, it'll probably also bring some diversity in with it. As an immigrant, if you ask me my hobbies, it's probably gonna be related to my culture and related to uh, something that would make me feel included. So that's how I would answer that question um, for the person who asked. And I think it's really uh, good that you're asking in a forum like this. Thank you, Franz. Um, and to that same individual, Dominique has offered her expertise as a former RA. Um, so please feel free to reach out to her. Um, Tara, you had something that you'd like to share? Yeah. Uh, so I was an RA for my first time this past year, and I'm going to be an RA again this year. Um, and I think what's really important um, about fostering community um, is that you understand that you're not always going to be right. Um, and that it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to learn. Um, but also when you're hosting programs, um, me personally, I don't know everything. Um, and, I, and I'm always learning. And so it's important that I reach out to people who are more educated than me to foster these kind of conversations. But also when you reach out to an office like MLD or Prevention and Wellness and they come in and they have these conversations, that also make sure that the space remains one um, that people can grow in and people can, can learn from. Because I, as one individual, one, I don't know everything um, about racial justice, um, but two, I may not know how to answer questions all the time. So it's okay to call on resources um, and make sure that you're, you're not handling it alone because it is okay to ask for help. Um, also, I think something that's really important is that Black History Month um, happens in February, um, but we should be programming um, and talking about history all the time. Um, and so not just in February, but whenever you can. Um, it's great that we have bulletin boards in February that talk about Black History Month, but there are things that are happening constantly that we should be celebrating the wins of people of color. And so we should be doing that all throughout. Um, so it's just important to kind of be mindful of where can you put an educational moment in? Where can you, you know, allow an educational lesson to take place um, and make it in the most you know, convenient way possible for it to be accessible to other students um, as well. Thanks, Tara. Um, I also have a private message question that wants to be asked. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, they wanted to ask if anyone had any suggestions or anything on how to have these sort of conversations with parents or family who may not see completely eye to eye with them. I do not want to go into conversation like that and get stuck halfway through not say or having to back down. I think Melissa said I to answer this question. Lisa. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think a big part of um, when you speak to your parents is obviously speak to them with respect because they are your parents, but just because they're your parents and they may disagree on certain things that you agree with, like continue to like teach them about it. Um, I personally don't really have that issue with my parents. My parents, um, I mean, my dad's, most of my dad's part of the family is actually um, black, but there's so, there are so many things that I speak to my parents about socially and or like with things going on here in America that they just don't understand. Like, for example, to my dad, it's like, he he's just like, why are they like, why are black people right now like going out there and like, allowing um themselves to get hurt because he's like the majority of the people that i see that are looting and that are like rioting aren't black but like at the end of the day like the people that are gonna are that are getting affected by it are is the black community and just not being afraid to like explain it to him to show him um to show them things i mean for my parents social media is like something that they don't go on but like showing them from your phone for me it would be translating to them like translating that it's like give them and give them an example of something that they feel very passionate about and ask them like okay if this is what was going on for you like would you do this like for example I I spoke to somebody from my church that I had a disagreement with 
and I, and they identify as Christian and that everything for them is God. And, and I was like, if right now they said like, there's no freedom of religion, like you can't be a Christian, like, um, people are getting killed for being Christian. Like, would you, um, go out and protest? Would you go out and protest for hours? Like for as long as you can, like, and by giving them that example, like it, it kind of like twists it around and it makes people like take it into consideration on themselves on how to agree on certain things. Thanks, Melly. Um, I just want to scroll down to really quick. Autumn, is this to answer the same question? Because I have another question that I'm going to address. Yes, to say answer. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I actually just had a conversation today with my grandma, you know, and I think one important thing is to be educated yourself um, and about what is going on and about everything. Um, that way you can back yourself up. And the second thing is, as you're learning, you know, share those things you're learning with them. Because the same way you're learning is probably how they're going to learn and realize what's happening. So it's important to share that experience with them because they're going to go through the same kind of learning process if they, you know, take the steps to learn. Thank you both, Melly and Autumn, for sharing that. Um, we have a question from a faculty member. Um, I'm teaching a I'm teaching freshmen this semester who may not speak up like you did, Sika. They said sorry to know that you've experienced what you have. Um, so how proactive should I be reaching out to students of color about their situation? I've been tracking grades and they have not dropped, but I'm very mindful of their situation and possible similarity to your situation, Sika. Do you or anyone else have any advice for how you would like your professor to reach out to you with support and or check up on you? Um, so I'll respond to that question and thank you so much, Adam, for stating that. Um, honestly, since I understand that students are different and it might, people might take it differently if you reach out to them specifically about this certain topic going on. But for me, since I did reach out, what I would have would have wanted from my professor was at least acknowledging how I was feeling. And even if you don't want to specifically individualize the person you're messaging out, I also would have preferred too if my professors that I'm having this summer could have at least make, sent an email to our class and said, you know, I understand there's a lot of things going on if you're having issues, if you're struggling, if, you know, whatever it may be here is how you can reach me please contact me please call me please let me know how i can support you as an individual um so if i were in your position um adam like as a professor i would email my students in my course and say hey like i am aware i understand what's going on please contact me i care about you you're important as an individual how can i support you um that would have probably made a difference. Even if she, they would have emailed me the day before with support that, you know, Sika, we understand this is hard for you, but how can we help? I think I would have done better on my exam, but feeling as though like no one's on my side, no one's trying to help me in this program wasn't very encouraging for me. Um, but I think in my opinion, um, as a person of color, I would appreciate, I would have appreciated that from my, my, my professors. And also like establish Establishing a relationship with your students that they feel comfortable to reach out to personally because although I know my professors it wasn't like some of the advisors that I have on campus um, that I would just call and say hey by the way like you know can we talk this out so just also to making sure that your students are comfortable with you and that you make it known that you care about them as individuals there's other RA um, references in the chat for those that are looking for ideas and that's everything that's in the chat so far. So you can keep going, Sika and Jamaica. Okay, and I also saw that Evelyn, um, who's actually a former member of DROP, stated too that when she was an RA, she put on different programs like um, microaggressions and um, different diversity and inclusion training. And like, I think it's important to understand that you have the ability to make a difference in whatever community that you're a part of so as an RA like you don't have to be a person of color in order to put on an event about microaggressions or about privilege and even if you don't understand about it 
there's resources that you can reach out to that people can come and facilitate and talk about it or even talking to your RA community like hey this is something that needs to be done how can we do it you know and last week when we put on this event with drop like I remember like feeling like oh my goodness like we already had an event plan but this is something that has to be done how can we change the event to make it happen and we did regardless and like in my nursing program, although I'm one of three in my cohort that are black, like I contacted NSA, the Nursing Student Association, and I contacted the advisor and the professor in that program who's in charge of the nursing program and the, the dean and director of the nursing program as well. And I contacted them and I said, hey, you know, like these are tough situations, but I'd like to host a Zoom or a discussion space where we can talk about these things. So although people might, Although you might feel as, as though it's hard, there's still stuff that you can do in order to make a difference. And if that's reaching out to the person in charge of the community, then do it. You know, the least that they can say is no. And honestly, as an RA, it's awesome that you have the autonomy to put on these events for your students and in your hall. But regardless of the community, reach out to the person and see if you can do it. And, and the people in my program, they gave me the okay to host you know, an event like this and to talk about these conversations with the different um, nursing students in my specific cohort. So regardless of what the answer may be, you never know. So just use your, your community and your voice in, in, in order to do so. Sorry. Um, okay, next slide. Janeka, when you get a chance. Okay, so students and community slash parents. So these are questions, again, kind of like I had on the other one, but pertaining to students and community and people who are parents as well. And so for the students specifically, like questions I have for you are like, are you calling out your peers? Are you speaking to the people who are your inner circle? Like who are the people that you hang around the most? Do you think that they know about these topics? Are you inviting them to discussions like this? Are you taking initiative in order to talk about it? And it's like last week, during this whole thing with my test going on, one of my peers in the nursing program, she's white, she called me and she called me and she's like, you know what, Sika, like, how are you? I know it's a loaded question. I don't even know how to ask, um, but how are you? And in her voice from the phone call, it's like, I could hear the anxiety. I could feel the stress that she was evoking onto me. And I knew why. It's because in situations like this with everything going on, as a white individual, how do you call your black peer and say, how are you? You know, it's a tough conversation. And she, she called me and she's like, Sika, like, this must be so tough for you. How are you studying for the exams? What's going on? How, like, I, I know I'm white. I don't understand everything. I never will understand anything. But I want to tell you, Sika, like, I care about you. I support you. You're important. And instead of asking me, even though it's important to always ask how you can support someone, she took the initiative to ask, hey, Sika, can we do a study session right now? Can, can I go over the material with you? Is that okay? And it's like, that meant the world to me because it's like, I didn't have to ask her to, to teach me the material or to have this study session with me. She asked herself intrinsically, hey, as an individual, what can I do to support Sika? And through that, she used our academics in order to help me. And she sat on the phone with me for four hours talking about the material, teaching me everything in the program. She called me at 6 a.m. the next day before my exam to go over the material with me to go over the material with me. And it's like, she took the initiative within herself to ask, what can I do right now in my point of privilege and understanding this material to help my fellow peer out who seek up? And that meant everything to me. And she broke down on the phone crying about how tough it must be, you know, and, and, and reaching out to me saying, I know I don't understand, but can you, can you, can you show me where, or can you lead me to what I can do in order to better educate myself, even though I know that I can. And it's like, unfortunately, and it's very sad to say this, but one of the reasons why I consider her one of my friends is because in the nursing program, she, she asks the questions that are important. She says, I remember our first day in foundations lab, she raised her hand and she said, hey, by the way, what does this look like in a person of color? What does it look like um, with someone with the darker skin tone? Where can I find this in my patient? And I remember that day I looked at her and I was like, wow, like someone cares, you know, I'm not the only one who has to speak. And she's not a person of color. She was someone who identifies as white. And after that day, I remember thinking to myself, wow, like, you know, I can, I can text her, I can call her, like, you know, she cares. And it's like, when I told her that last week on the phone, she broke down crying and she's like, wow, like this, 
this world is horrible. It takes me to ask a question like that for you to feel safe enough to talk to me and know that you can trust me as an individual and as a peer. And unfortunately, like, yeah, you know, like, unfortunately, yeah, it really took that much. So it's kind of like, take initiative to talk to your peers and understand your privilege. And one of the things she asked was like, well, what's, what, what's one thing I can do? And I was like, well, you know what? You're in different spaces than me. The people that you surround yourself with are white. They identify with white. You're in white organizations, a lot of predominantly white clubs. Use that privilege in your space. When someone says something that isn't that, speak up to it. Use your privilege in your space, which is typically predominantly white. Speak about it with your little sister. And then besides that, she said, you know what, Sika, I support you. If you end up doing this nursing event or whatever it may be, I'll be there. I'll speak up. I'll talk. I want to be better. It shouldn't be this way. So something as simple as that, although she had anxiety calling me, which I could feel and, and I could feel it, like I could feel it. Although she had anxiety, she still picked up the phone. She still called. She still asked me how she can support me. Um, so keep those things in mind. Take initiative. Don't wait on someone to tell you how you can support them. Ask them, hey, can I study with you? Is that going to help? So that's something that stuck out to me from my, my peer last week. And then in reference to community and parents, it's like, think about these specific questions. You know, do you have these conversations in your home? Do you have these conversations in your home? Are your children's toys diverse? Or is it only one specific skin color? It's super important to ask these questions and to, to instill it into our youth, into the younger generations in order to understand. Like I'm having to read these books to my little cousins and talk to them. I'm having to teach my little, my little cousin that her hair is really nice, regardless of how big it may look. It's beautiful that way and that's what makes her unique. So are we having these conversations? As parents, are you speaking to your kid about it? It's as young as, super young that these children are saying these things, are bringing these things out into conversations with their peers. So at what age do you feel it's okay that, hey, you know what, maybe I'll mention this to my children, to my cousins, to my family members. So that's a big thing. Like, ask yourself these questions and, and see if you're modeling the way. Are you modeling the way? Are you leading by example? Or are you partaking in these things? Are you being, are you silenced? Are you going on with everyday life as though people aren't suffering? And just because it's being brought to light in society now doesn't mean this isn't something that we didn't grow up with, that it's not something that I didn't experience, that people who look like me haven't experienced. So make sure you ask these questions with yourself. And I think it's very important to be honest. Be honest. Be honest with yourself. Understand what you don't know in order to educate yourself and be the best version of myself. And I remember, so I lived in Haiti for some of my life. And I remember when I came back, one of the things, or when I was there, I told myself, you know what, I want to be as, I was 14 or 13, and I was like, I, I want to be the best version of myself, regardless of what, that, of what that may look like. And being the best version of yourself doesn't mean going, doesn't just mean going out every day and exercising, eating the good foods, educating yourself, blah, blah, blah. It means being the best version of yourself in whatever way that may look like. So if it's as simple as making sure that you're not letting these little conversations or these little jokes slide, or that you're just sitting around being a bystander. Like it means being the best version of yourself in every aspect of the way. And that starts with being honest with yourself. What can I do to improve? How can I be better? And that's something that I, it's a person, it's always been and it will always be a personal mission of myself. So when I know that I'm not educated on specific matters, I look these things up and I'm honest with myself. I know what I don't know and I make it a point to learn. So keep these questions in mind and be involved in the community at FGCU and whatever that specific community may look like. Speak up, take initiative. Don't be afraid to do things differently. And it can be hard. It can be extremely hard. And for me, like I'm the president of DROP and it's the Dominican Republic Irish program. I'm the first African-American program and I'm the first um, president who doesn't fluently speak Spanish. And in being in that role, it was tough because it's like, dang, like, this is not what the people in my position before me look like or embodied. But you know what? Regardless, I'm going to do my best to take initiative and make a difference in this position that I'm in. And that's currently what I'm trying to do. So it's kind of like understand that you, it doesn't matter what it looked like before. It doesn't matter what the RA did prior to you or what they say should be done. It's about what has to be done, regardless of how hard it may be. And it, it's hard and it will always be hard, but 
things that are hard, and y'all probably heard the saying, but things that are easy probably aren't worth doing, and things that are hard are always worth it in the long run. So just keep that in mind when you're having these difficult conversations because it's super important. It's super important. And I think that if they're being had in black, house, black households, they should be had in other households too. Does anyone have anything they want to comment on this slide? Okay. And then some general questions to ask yourself. Do I know what my privilege looks like? Will I use my position to empower students? What have I taken away from today? And what do I want to look more into? So again, these are things that I touched on a little bit prior, but understand what your privilege look like, looks like. It's, 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 it's big. There's so many things that make us privileged. And I know it can be hard, the whole conversation of, privilege and everything that embodies it but something that always or something that I think about is like white privilege does not mean your life isn't hard it means that one of those difficulties will never have to do with the color of your skin that's what that means and that's why it's important to talk about it because like Janika said prior before people even know her name or what she's a part of they see that she's a black individual and that's a hard life to live and that's why it's harder African-Americans and people of color, myself, I'll speak for myself. I work hard. I work harder so that it's like people know like, hey, my name is Sika. My name is Sika. I'm not just Negra. I'm not just a black female. Like my name is Sika and I stand for something and I have things that are important to me. And it's about instilling that into other people, understanding your privilege, understanding your privilege, understanding that your voice is a privilege. Um, and that's something that's always important to me. And even though sometimes I feel that pressure of, oh, like I'm always the one who has to speak up. I'm always the one who has to ask this question. I still do it. Why? Because I'm not afraid to speak up and I know that it has to be done. So my privilege is a voice because thankfully I'm not me. I have the opportunity to use my privilege no matter what people may look at me like. And it's like, if you're in specific positions or in specific communities, if you're a part of student government, and you don't like the way things are being done, you don't like what people are saying, or you don't think this person is this and this person is that, well, if you're in that specific community, speak to that person directly, talk to them, talk to that person directly, let them know how you feel, because that's what's gonna make the difference. If you're, if you're too afraid to call out to that person, then how do you expect to make a change? So I think these are extremely important um, questions to think about and regardless of what you took away from some of the topics we've spoken about I hope you took something I hope you took something and I'm gonna look at the chat um, so Ilema said something she said one thing that stood out to me is when we were talking was privilege. When I was in middle school, sometimes before entering school, we would get patted down and our backpacks were checked before entering school property. And because I am white, they would rarely check me, but my black peers were patted down roughly and treated poorly. Looking back at it, I wish I would have said something, but I've taken those moments and educated myself to use my privilege to advocate and stand for others. And that's important that, you know, Ilema is reflecting on these things. What other things have you all experienced that you maybe didn't speak up then? What would you have done differently? What can you do differently? These situations pass daily. Are you going to let them pass? Or are you going to use your voice in order to speak up? And I saw that Gervais put in, uh, an I. So, G, if you want to speak up, go for it. Yeah, thank you, Sika. And I want to thank Drop and MLD for partnering and collaborating to host this event. Um, but I just had a couple of things on my mind that I, I wanted to share with everybody before we start, because I noticed that there's a lot of faculty on this call. Um, and, and while that's great and we feel and we see the faculty support, it's important for us as a student body, as students at FGCU, to advocate for that change. And so a couple of things I want to talk about right now are just power, privilege, and inclusion. And so Usually people in power don't like to share that power um, and they especially don't like to lose that power. And so us as, as a student body, as a community, we need to continue to demonstrate. We need to continue to support each other. We need to continue to advocate for each other. 
Um, and that comes with being a truly inclusive student body, a truly inclusive society. And that change starts right here in our own FDCU community, right? We can't go ahead and make that change in the state of Florida and the United States when we can't even make that change right here on our campus. And so a lot of it, I think, is continuing to support each other, continuing to attend events, continuing to be there, not only now that there is a, not only now that there is, you know, the, the situation going on in our world, in our society, but continuing to do that as the fall semester rolls around and onward, because that's where the true change starts, right here in our own community. And so I think that that's, a, when, when people in power see, you know, Black people rallying together, that scares them. But it scares them even more when they see Black people, white people, Latina people, people from all across the world, all different walks of life rallying together and supporting each other towards a common goal, a shared vision, a shared vision of equality and equity in our society. And so I think that that's just something that I, I really wanted to share and get off my chest, that we need to continue to support each other, not only in forums like this, but continue to support each other and continue to hold forums like this, continue to have students speak and have let their voice be heard, because I think it's truly important for not, not only now that we're going through, you know, the, this tragic uh, time in, in, you know, the nation and world's history, but I, I think that's impor important that we continue to do that, you know, for the foreseeable future um, and onward. And that's how we enact true change in our society. And that's it. Thank you, G. Um, like, again, thank you for your words. Like, I feel like everything that you said kind of puts in strings together what a lot of us are feeling, especially the students of color. Um, and I just want to kind of segue into the next part of the presentation where we open up the floor to anyone that wants to say anything, whether you're sharing your experiences, sharing some of your, your thoughts like G did, or just anything you want to say or ask any questions that you want to ask, like this would be the time to do it. And we don't mind silence, so if you need a few seconds to think about it, go for it. Dr. Blakely, please take the floor. Yes, I want to kind of ditto some of the things that have been said in the chat to first give uh, appreciation to the know. students who have led this presentation. I think it's important that in this space that your voices were heard. So I appreciate your willingness to have this labor of love. I often mention that it's not hard work, but it's hard work. And you can tell that you all put your hearts into this. So I just want to say how grateful we are in that in this space and also kind of just remind people that we need to create more forums and more opportunities to hear from the students. Too often as faculty and staff and administration, we get in the way of the student's voice. So I think we need to find spaces to amplify these voices so we can truly support them and provide the services they need. Uh, we have to be willing to, to listen to those uh, who we ordinarily don't listen to because uh, these are unordinary times, so we have to do unordinary things. We have to be willing to read things that we don't necessarily read, whether it's from a faculty or staff perspective. Um, we have to be able to stand with people so we can withstand these turbulent times. I think it's important that we look at a country not as uh, my country right or wrong, but we must commit to having my country to right or wrong. So I think it's really important for us to stand up, to speak out, um, to learn, to educate one another and continue to unite because I think it's so important that we can't do this on our own. We have to be willing to unite with one another to do that. So thank you to the students who led today and we will commit as uh, Campus Life, as MLD to continue this conversation, not just in this evening, but in the future. How do you like? Um, going based off of like things that survey touched on, I know that as students, like we want to be there for each other because the reality is like the world isn't going to change overnight. Um, yes, we can change the world, but you know it takes time. It takes a lot of effort to do so. But I know like here at the FG, like with many of us here within this chat right now um there's student government um representatives there's people in different rso's uh, faculty and staff in different areas of campus like it times like this where everyone right here is gathered in one call like take advantage of that take advantage to share your voice to all these different departments on campus um i know that 
it meant so much when a couple student government sen senators reached out to the black community asking us like, we want to help, how can we do so? And just a short little call, it wasn't short, it was like a couple, um, maybe one or two hours. And they sat there and they just listened for two hours to black students on our campus and listen to some of the experience that we've had, like some of you have done so today. And we are hoping as, for, as black students on this campus that they're able to take some of the things that we shared and implement them the way that they want to implement them. And just kind of recognize that they were listening to us and listening to what we experience as black students on this campus because it's not something that's started recently. It's always, I feel like this is probably something that's always been here at FGCU. It just wasn't brought to light or just what And thank you to everyone that just showed up today. Just stopping by to listen means so much. Thank you, Janaika. And I see that Melly has an eye. She put an eye. Yes, yeah, really quick. I just wanted to encourage you all. Um, uh, come out to events that are hosted by multicultural organizations. Come out to events hosted by MLD. And um, don't just do it because you want to um, fit in. You want to post up like, okay, look, I'm, I'm doing something. Do it because you actually want to do this because you're actually willing to learn. Like, don't, don't come to events if you're just there to be there. Come to events because you actually want to get involved and surround yourself with people of color, with people from different backgrounds than you do. Be open to learn about other people. Be open to having different friends. I have friends from all over the world, um, all over the Caribbean islands. Like, be open to that. Don't just close yourself out and stick to the same friend group. Expand your friendships. Um, start talking to other people, but do it only if you actually feel it in your heart to do it and that you actually want to do it. Like, please don't be doing this if you really don't care. You're just doing it so somebody can see you. Like, so somebody can say, okay, look, she was hanging out with um, an African-American today. She's not racist. Remember that that doesn't mean anything. Actually want to do it. Actually want to be around those people. Like, because they're people just like us. It's not, they're black. No, you're hanging out with a person. You're hanging out with a person that's just like you. That is the same race as you because we're all one race, like Jane Elliott said, so. Just try to expand your horizons more when it comes to that. Thank you, Molly. And then I see in the chat, we have Marisa put an eye, and then after that, Autumn. Hi, everyone. So this is actually Su Susel um, with Marisa. We're just here um, watching together. So um, this is Susel Ramos. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the students that um, definitely put this on. You're so amazing. Yes, hi, <laughs> I was on the chat. And um, thank you, Job, thank you, MLD. Thank you everyone for being and attending and just um, participating. But I just want to say um, how much that I personally, hi, Jeremy, <laughs> um, want to say um, that I'm a really big advocate as well for everything that's happening and just how we need to keep really focusing on action. And I'm very big because I've been living in the Southwest Florida community for a majority of my life. So this is, again, just saying thank you, but um, that I want to help and contribute to get this message out to a lot more people in Southwest Florida. U.S. students are doing such great work that this needs to be definitely um, talked about more with residents, with people that live in the community that can support um, everything that you're doing because it needs to be noticed and it needs to be heard about and i'm just saying that thank you again um but i want to help in that way and i think everyone should also just should really think about that too um fgc was a really big part of southwest florida and this, this needs to you know be talked about when it comes to in collaborations with like lee county and um talks about when um you think about all the school systems here too so let's definitely keep talking but then taking action to do more of those um, initiatives as well. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you everyone for everything you all had to say too, for sure. Thank you, Susan. Um, and then Autumn, if you wanted to take the floor. 
Yeah, so I actually, I just shared the information in the chat. I was unable to s send the image on my phone of the flyer, but we are having a student government senate um, this coming Tuesday, June 9th at 6.30, and uh, we're going to be talking about ways that FGCU can stand in solidarity. Um, there's going to be a public comment section at the beginning if anyone wants to share their thoughts or ideas. So, um, you know, please attend. It's open to everybody. Thank you so much for that, Autumn. I know that um, I'm personally going to be trying to attend a student government meeting. So again, thank you for that. Or the Senate meeting, sorry. Um, Catherine, I see you put Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you again so much for all of the work you did, um, both the preparation and the, the vulnerability you all showed today. Um, I did just wanna highlight that the NAACP of Collier County is hosting um, a, uh, a protest uh, this Wednesday in Naples um, at the Collier County Courthouse at six o'clock. Um, so if you're able to make it to that, um, that would be really awesome. Um, come find me if you want a buddy. I'd say carpool, but that doesn't allow social distancing. But you can wave at me from from six feet, and we can we can be there together. And I don't see any more eyes in the chat, but I do see a little bit of comments. So if you guys want to take the time on your own to read some of these. Um, Dr. Blakely did post a flyer for the Senate meeting that is happening tomorrow. And it has the Zoom link information on it. So if anyone was interested in attending um, that meeting, there you go. And yes, so we just have one more slide for you all. And this is just something for you guys to take with you after you leave here. So until you fix it here, and address it here, nothing changes here. So until you fix it in your heart and address it at your home, nothing changes in the world. And there's one more thing that we wanted to share with you. I'm gonna go ahead and share, um, or give Isa the ability to share her screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I paused sharing for you all. So this tiny graphic was just what I um, just put into words for you all, just so you can guys can see it. Yeah, and something to kind of touch on that is definitely the big thing is the heart. And it's like, regardless of whether, depending on your department, diversity and inclusion training is, be, is a requirement or attending a specific quota of MLD events is a requirement. Just because you attend doesn't mean that the difference is being made. And I've gone to, I've done multiple facilitations as a MAP where I see that I'm speaking to a group of people are, who are here because they have to be here. So unless you want to be there, it doesn't matter. Like, oh yeah, you know, well, I have this certificate. I'm, I'm certified. That doesn't mean anything if you don't really care about change and if you don't fix it first in your heart. So remember, it's about your heart. It's about why you're doing it. It's really about why you're doing it. And it doesn't go unnoticed. It doesn't go unnoticed. So keep that in mind. So that's actually a fantastic transition. Um, we've created a document that we'll be sharing um, with everybody um, on action steps that you all can take um, as faculty, staff, and students. Um, first and foremost, again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to the DROP team for putting this presentation together and making some tweaks for today's um, session. Um, thank you for partnering with us and um, making this such an incredible conversation. You're so appreciated. But we also want to make sure that we leave everybody with what can you do now? Now that you know what what's next, right? So these are some steps that we've put together. It is a two-page document. So this is one uh, page one, and I'll leave it up for a second so that everybody can read it and look at it. And I'll show the second page. And we will document and that page with everybody in the chat and we will also be sharing that on our social media in addition to um uh our eagle link page sorry i had a moment where of i couldn't not um think about what words i was saying sorry that happens when you do multiple things at once so i apologize this is page one and then i'll go ahead and scroll to page two um, and I want to thank Beverly Jensen for creating this for us. She's absolutely amazing, our marketing person in Campus Life. So 
um, great, great, great um, work on this and bringing to life. And I so appreciate you and everything that you do for us. So this is just, again, an opportunity for you all to see things that you can do, take action steps and really put what your education is to action. Um, just a few things uh, for faculty and staff um, and for other students. I purposely did not speak or answer on certain questions today. This was meant to be student led. Um, so when I asked the questions, it was just to ask the question follow up with an answer, um, with the exception of the one that Autumn asked me to ask, answer specifically. Um, but it, it was done on purpose to empower our students to have their voice and to express themselves and to really take ownership and really um, provide that voice for themselves and for their peers. So um, that is why I kind of took that back seat. So I don't want anyone to think that I was like on purpose not answering, although I was purposely not answering, <laughs> um, so that the students could have that opportunity. Um, and uh, to follow that up as faculty and staff, um, fa uh, the MLD family as well as Campus Life will be having a follow up for just faculty and staff where we can have deeper questions on next steps and seeing how we can um, assist you in that transition. So Dr. Blakely has dropped in the chat the document. So if you want to download it, um, I guess my link wasn't working. So um, love empowering of the students. You all did a wonderful job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's our pleasure. It's what we try and do. Um, it's what our purpose is. So um, last note, um, that's pretty much it. So uh, once again, I greatly appreciate everybody being here. Um, if anyone has any final thoughts or comments, you can either drop them in the chat or mute yourself and we can discuss. Um, once again, thank you to the DROP leadership team for putting this together. Thank you all for taking time out of your evening and being here with us for two wonderful hours of conversation and learning. Um, you know, it takes very strong individuals and very much confidence in yourselves to put your conversation. So I appreciate it knowing that you all are the ones that we can depend on on our campus when push comes to shove, whether that's being a student, a faculty member, or a staff member. Um, so know that you all are appreciated. We see you and we believe in we. Any thank you, thank you. Comments? And I have a comment and I just wanna say again, thank you all for being here and for allowing us to speak and allowing our voices to be heard. And I know a lot of times I'll speak as a student at FGCU, sometimes I feel like I'm not heard and like my voice isn't important and what I have to say isn't important. But the fact that all of you all attended just to listen to what we have to say means a lot. And for a lot of you all who didn't speak or put anything in the chat, I still feel like listening is extremely important and that's the first step to understanding what you don't know and what you can do in order to make that difference. Um, so I want to say thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening and thank you everyone who attended because that's the first step um, in the right direction. On behalf of DROP, we love and appreciate y'all and hopefully you all come to our events when we host them. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. For coming. I love seeing all the familiar names. It makes me so happy. Good night, Maria. everyone. Um, I may be an unfamiliar name, but I just want to take the time to thank you uh, for this presentation and just having a really open dialogue about what's going on and, um, you know, just, just keep fighting the good fight because there's so many people that are affected by this, so many people. And, you know, my daughter and I just had a recent conversation and she said, you know what, Ma? I'm not going to look at it as racism. I'm going to look at it as activism. And I really, really had to think about that. And, and it's just being active in ending this, not just 
proclaiming it, just putting an end to it. And I just want to thank you all for being so bold and, and being passionate about what you're going through and, and what your friends are going through, parents, colleagues, neighbors, you know, we, we have to all be in this together to make it change. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank Good night. you so much for sharing that. Really Thank you for allowing me to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you, Miss Alex. Thank you, Miss Alex. <laughs> love you. Miss you. Miss you. I love you guys. <laughs> are you <Yeah>. crying? <laughs> oh, Miss Alex. <laughs> y'all, y'all are amazing. Y'all are so you're 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 doing you're doing everything. You, you, I'm done. Bye. Yeah, I we to. cry. <laughs> Bye. Oh. Now I'm not the only crybaby. Oh. <laughs> Maggie's still on. Maggie, you good? Maggie. And so is Dom. Meg. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there went Meg. <laughs> <laughs> I love seeing how like the room. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop recording now.